Okay, we're good to go. All right, welcome. Happy Friday, everyone. Welcome to our second book reading. We are honored to have Paul Hansen here with us today. So welcome, Paul Hansen. Paul Hansen is a devoted husband of the beloved Laura Clark Hansen. After Laura's passing in 2016, Paul has made it his life's mission to keep her memory alive through publishing and promoting her book, Please Send Hats. Please Send Hats is Laura's memoir of her very moving and often hilarious journey with ovarian cancer. Paul is a very proud supporter of WOCA. Each year, he raises thousands of dollars to sponsor scholarships for ovarian cancer survivors to attend Can't Make a Dream. Welcome, Paul Hansen. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Paul is going to read a chapter out of Laura's book. Um, we've got some um, funny YouTube videos of her performances throughout the years. And then we're going to do a little fun um, trivia as well. So if you don't have your true and false card you've got some time to get it together so welcome paul thank you thank you ashley and jennifer for inviting me to this um thank you for not making me follow laura yeah <laughs> to follow laura <laughs> she's a tough one to follow that's really? for sure um i'm going to read from please send hats by laura clark hansen and i'm going to read an excerpt from the chapter called Hair and Loss. And La Laura could never get used to wearing wigs. They were either too itchy or too hot or both. And she was afraid she'd be in a social situation and just have to rip it off. <laughs> so she decided on hats. My sisters, nieces, and girlfriends had been chomping at the bit to get involved. Holding them at arm's length had been difficult for me and terribly hard on all of them. Finally, the opportunity had arrived to welcome them into my treatment journey. Hats, please send hats. And they did. Hats arrived one after another. I had hats for every mood, every circumstance and every season. Warm hats, cool hats, exotic hats and bizarre hats. I watched and waited for the transformation to begin. I checked the mirror several times a day and heard echoes of my mother encouraging me to be patient. A watched pot never boils. I learned that hair loss wasn't something that happened all at once, one day there, the next day gone. I was told that it was often a patchy and messy process. It might coat the tub or fill my brushes or drift across the pillow where my restless head tossed. My hairdresser, Anne, knew what was ahead of me. So even before the first chemo session, she called. Maybe I could just come by your house and shorten things up a bit. She hesitated only an instant and then continued to make the transition a bit easier. Anne had been my stylist for ages. As any woman who has had a long-standing relationship with her stylist knows, this is one of the most intimate friendships she has, surpassed only by her partner and maybe her closest friends. Anne arrived on a sub-zero windshield morning and without pausing to take off her coat or mittens, flung herself into my arms and held on for dear life. She asked Paul if he was planning on sticking around. We both held our breath, waiting for his response. Anne knew about Paul's hair phobia. He is deathly afraid of hair, loose hair. I learned this by accident one Easter when I made him a plate of delicious deviled eggs. Unbeknownst to me, a stray strand had floated through the air and planted itself in the middle of one of the golden ovals. He didn't see it until it was almost in his mouth. Yuck. <laughs> Having had such a close encounter with this personal kryptonite, he has refused deviled eggs ever since. If a particularly persistent hostess insisted, he would politely take one, but I knew it would find a home inside a napkin, which would be discreetly placed into a wastebasket. The Easter trauma was just too much. <laughs> uh, you two probably want to talk, he shuddered and beat a hasty retreat to his man cave in the basement. There was no mirror in the kitchen, so I had no way to gauge the progress. 
As she snipped and trimmed, we chatted and laughed and caught up on the news of her children and our mutual friends. It all felt so normal, except for the fact that we were in my tiny kitchen rather than her upscale salon. She plugged in the clippers and chirped, I'll just clean up the neck and then we'll be done. Bzzz. This was still my favorite part of any short haircut. Are you ready to see yourself, she asked. We walked together into the bathroom and she stood behind me with her hands on my shoulders. Awakening a memory from long ago, I said, I look just like a pixie. Anne encouraged me to call as soon as things got patchy so that she could shave me clean. She was certain I would be beautiful bald. You've got a perfect head for this, she insisted. After a quick hug, she slipped out the side door. The salon bib she had used was folded in her hands, cradling the frizzy waist. With a flick of her wrist, she lofted my wispy strands into the winter sunshine. With a smile on her face and a wave in my general direction, she was gone, refusing to take anything but my gratitude. It was now just a matter of losing it. I learned that the reason why some forms of chemotherapy cause people to lose their hair is because the chemicals destroy the fast growing cells and hair cells are one of those fast growers. Since the powerful drugs can't tell the difference between healthy fast growing hair cells and unhealthy fast growing cancer cells, it destroys them both. A couple of weeks after my second treatment at the very end of January, it began. While in the shower with the water pounding my tense shoulders, I stood transfixed holding a clot of wet hair and I was flooded with relief. It occurred to me that the chemotherapy must be working. If it was killing my hair follicles, I reasoned, then it must be killing the other offensive cells, the cancer cells. I wondered if it was time to call Anne again. Was I ready to get the full meal deal, the clean shave? Paul's vote was no. I was confused. He'd been such a rock. I wondered if my hair loss was his Achilles heel. Was this going to be his breaking point, I asked myself? Was this going to make the whole thing just too real for him? I can do it, he stated with unwavering confidence. You wanna shave my head, I asked, stunned. Yeah, he smiled. Yeah, I do. He purchased a Remington Precision hair clipper that promised to give a superior cut every time and used Lady Schick for the big finish. He found some sweet smelling shaving gel with a special moisturizer at Walgreens. This was another of cancer's gifts. The experience was intensely emotional. Truly the only thing more intimate than having sex or sharing a meal is shaving a loved one's head. By the third treatment, I was completely hairless. The rest to go were my eyebrows and eyelashes. I felt strangely slick and clean, like a dolphin or an eel. It had never occurred to me that the process would kill hair everywhere, even in the secret unseen places. I didn't have to shave my underarms or legs again for months. And it's the first and only time I've ever had a Brazilian. Ah, the gifts of cancer. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm going to share my screen again and show some of the clips of Laura. All right. So if you've ever seen Laura live, I'm sure you remember some of these performances, but we've got three here for you. I was raised in the 70s. In the if it feels good, do it. Generation, if we were allegedly so good at doing it, I heard so bad at talking about it. Huh? I think it was the way we were educated. Grandma Clark began our indoctrination into the wonderful world of womanhood early. Sitting like sparrows on a picket fence, my sisters and I listened to her every word. With the smoke drifting up into her eyes. <laughs> Off the beds and in hedges, 100 cigarettes dangling dangerously from her lips. 
she issued a host of confusing advice about the female condition. When you girls become ladies, they're gonna suffer the curse every month. It's filthy. She paused and puffed pensively. And then she tapped the glowing ash into the tiny World Fair commemorative plate she purchased at a junk store near the farm. When I was a girl, we take old flowers ash. Fold them over and over and over again. Then we pin them to the inside of our floors. It's a filthy mess. <laughs> Girlie, her hair with comb soaked in beer and dippity do. <laughs> <laughs> she corkscrew the wispy strands into nests and then secured them to her head with crisscross buttons. And while she briefed us on the horrors of childhood. <laughs> a few seconds of sexual satisfaction for what? Nine months and 18 years of hell. <laughs>
Um, and at the end of the day, I literally was jet propelled out of the classroom and into the hotel room where I and my husband would recline on the beds, me in the breaking wind position for yoga. <laughs> and, and my poor husband, we're still married, God love you. Um, so B, bloating. E, eating issues. A, abdominal pain or pressure. We were sitting in a hotel room somewhere, I think, in Nebraska. And I was sitting on the edge of the bed. It was retreating voicemail messages, farting like a mowing boat. And Paul was um, reclined on the bed opposite me. And I felt this strange pressure in my pelvic cradle. And it was one of those time stood still moments that they both talked about me about, oh boy, my life is about to change. I just knew it. Something was not right. And I turned to Paul, who was on the bed opposite mine, and I said, honey, I think I need to see the doctor. And he asked why, and I said, there's a toad in my uterus. There's something in there. It's about the size of my fist. And I called the doctor, and things moved forward so quickly for me. The moment, because like I said, this doctor was just phenomenal, she immediately asked all the right questions, she um, did a vaginal exam, ordered a transvaginal ultrasound and a CA-125. Ten days later, I was in surgery. They didn't suspect ovarian cancer going in because my CA-125 was so low. And the transvaginal ultrasound didn't show anything suspicious. Um, but I awoke to the um, gynecologist who was doing the surgery, um, but I'll talk more about that in a minute. I woke to her um, face when I needed to focus and the news that I had ovarian cancer. And I said one word, I said, shit. And <laughs> she agreed. That the great news is that because of this hospital's policy, it's their policy to call in a gynecologic oncologist if cancer is found or they sew you shut and wait till they don't finish you because they know that the standard of care can't be achieved. So, um, and the staging can't be done. And so I was so grateful that a gynecologic oncologist was available, called in on an emergency basis, and I was finished. So the last one is T, tinkle, 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 urinary tract issues, frequency, urgency. The, the indicator there was, um, I just, I found I was having pee more and more as the day progressed. And you know, teachers are notorious for not taking breaks anyway. They all get terrible bladder infections, so you'll be seeing a lot of them with bladder infections. <laughs> but I couldn't hold it. I would be, you know, like saying, okay kids, we're gonna take five, everybody, you know, and we'll just reconvene. And they'd be so confused, their little brows would furrow. They'd be like, we just had a break. <laughs> like, yes! I know! And I would have all these poor little things out. Hurry to the bathroom and come back. So B E A T, bloating, eating issues, abdominal pain, no pressure, and tickle, tickle, tickle. Um, our lives are in your hands. My little niece, Ella, I think, said it best. She um, loved. How many of you have been to Violas Park Zoo? Oh, it's like a free zoo. You gotta go. It's just so cool. And so Ella and I were at the zoo, and she loves the herpetorium where all the reptiles are and the dark night creatures, you know? And so Ella, um, that was the first place she wanted to go when we went in. And she loves the chameleon exhibit, and she loves to take people there. Because, you know, can you see it? So she drags me over there, and she goes, okay, do you see it? And I was like, yeah, I do. <laughs> see it? She's like, do. <laughs> so she took me over to where the sign is, and there's a little picture of the chameleon on there. And she says, okay, it's got really bulgy eyes, and it's got this long tail that gets skinnier and skinnier and skinnier, and it's going to be the same color as what it's on. And I was like, okay. So I went back over, and she said, now that you know what you're looking for, you can see it. And by God, I saw it. I think of ovarian cancer as the chameleon of cancer. It's hiding right there in plain sight. And once you know 
what it sounds like, what it looks like, what it feels like, you're going to save women's lives. Because women do experience these symptoms, even in the early stages, according to the research by Dr. Berbatov. Our lives are in your hands. And we're so grateful to you for all of you. Thank you. So, Paul, do you want to share a little information about the book that you have for us? And then we'll do a little question and answer. Yeah, just a few things. Laura, like I said, Laura started writing the book in 2010 after we had moved back to Wisconsin. And originally she was going to call it, I may be hit by a bus tomorrow. <laughs> because if anybody ever tried to comfort her by saying, well, you know, we're all going to die. I may be hit by a bus tomorrow. She was so tempted to respond, oh, have you been running from the bus for years? And this was, um, she started doing a theatrical version of Please Send Hats, and that was a portion that you saw, or <laughs> we're supposed to see with Grandma Clark at the, at the Woka Survivors Brunch in 2012. And that was just a portion of the 45 minute play that she performed all over the Midwest. And then she recurred in 2013 and had many, many complications. The last couple of chapters in the book were written in early 2016 and she passed away later that year. But she made me promise I would get the book published. And she also suggested that I have her younger sister, Karen, help me edit it. And that was a very wise choice. Because Karen and she have the same sensibility and the same sense of humor, wicked senses of humor. <laughs> so Karen was the perfect person to help me with that. So in 2017, Karen and I started editing the book and our process was sending chapters back and forth via email using Google Docs. Um, the book was published in 2018 by Orange Hat Publishing, which was perfect. And my main intent is for people to read the book and to get to know Laura. Thank you, Paul. And as Marianne was saying earlier, that you can really hear Laura's voice when you read the book. And it's fabulous that you have all those YouTube videos of her and you can really kind of keep her memory alive through those. All right, we are going to do a little uh, trivia about Laura and then we'll do some question and answer. Those are the videos. All right, so Laura's grandmother was the first policewoman in Madison. Let's go say that. True, true. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we know that that is true. <laughs> Paul, do you have any information on that for us? Um, <laughs> if you read the, the, actually the hair and loss chapter has a story about her um, going with her grandmother to get a haircut at a men's <laughs> barbershop. <laughs> and they talk about Hilda. Hilda had a little black book that had a little bit of information about all of the goings on in Madison. Oh and everybody gosh. was really afraid of her because she had all this information um, that <laughs> you didn't want to be in Hilda's black book because she knew everything. And she patrolled. I mean, she patrolled the streets. And a lot of times she dealt with prostitutes that were quite prevalent in Madison. OK. <laughs> so, I, and actually, they called her a matron, but she was a policewoman. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. All right. Laura is one of five siblings. I think that's true. True, true. That's false. There were 12 <laughs> children in Laura's family, nine girls and three boys. Uh -oh. Wow. That's was she lot. the oldest or youngest, Paul? She was the third in line. There's she was Mary the third in line. And then Laura. Wow. 12 kids, wow. All right. Paul and Laura first met at the Fireside Theater in Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin. True and false. false. All right, <laughs> mixing it up. True. That is true. <laughs> any details, any juicy <laughs> gossip you want to tell us about that, Paul? <laughs> we met uh, doing a, a, a play of My Fair Lady. Oh. I played Colonel Pickering and she played Higgins housekeeper, Mrs. Pierce. Oh, and so you guys were in the play together. Oh yeah, yeah. 
Oh, Got it. I had been in a couple shows there and then she showed up to do My Fair Lady and we fell in love. <laughs> the rest is history. Exactly. The actor yeah. house, which is kind of, <laughs> we all, we all lived in, in the same townhouse. So. Yeah. Wow. Do we have any questions, Joni or Marianne for Paul? Gosh, I'm trying to think of some here. Um, so Paul, what are you doing now? Pardon me? What are you doing now, Paul? Thank you. Um, I, during the pandemic, I was going nuts being <laughs> sheltered in place here. Um, and online, somebody, somebody posted, um, does anybody know how to digitize a VHS C tape? And I was like, hey, I know how to do that. <laughs> so I did that for her and I thought, I, I can do this. Why don't I just start a little business? Oh. So I started a business. Actually, the, the business that Laura and I had, uh, our, our theatrical company, training acting troops and stuff, was called Cornerstone Productions, LLC. Mm -hmm. So I just called this business Cornerstone Productions VHS. And <laughs> all last year and starting this year, I have been digitizing VHS, beta, eight millimeter cassettes, mm -hmm. audio cassettes. And actually I've been quite busy all year doing that. So, so if you have any of that old stuff, just go online. Um, on, I have a Facebook page called Cornerstone Productions VHS and I'll hook you up. Well, we can, we'll put that link too in the social media post. So if any, um, and I, th you delivered sometimes too, don't you, Paul? You pick up and deliver. Yes, I, I saw. Do. Actually, I've gone as far as Fort Atkinson to pick them up and to, to digitize wow. and then, then deliver them. So wow. excellent. It's pretty much yeah. been in the Madison area. That I've been. Uh, mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. Any I know other I saw questions? That I, I saw that on Marianne. Facebook, Paul, that you were doing that. And then I haven't been on Facebook since like March. I just couldn't take it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm kind of behind on knowing what people are up to. But one question about that. Do you do the little um, the little slides that you put into a slide projector? Do you, can you I, digitize I those? Can, um, I have a slide scanner. What I, I've, I've been looking for is it's, it's very labor intensive and I'm really bet, yeah, not yeah. lazy, but I've been looking on online to find something that, that works a little faster than that. And uh -huh. once I do, I will offer that too. I have when, a bunch of those, but I don't know if they're worth saving or not. I'm just gonna kind of go through them. And, when Laura and I met back to, when met back, when we moved back to Wisconsin, we were supposedly semi-retired <laughs> and that's when the stock market crashed and we had to go back to work full time. Uh -huh. um, but I started scanning these slides that her dad took which were just beautiful. They're in, in beautiful color. And, and I, I did that, but it, it just, it, it really takes a long time. I bet, I bet, yeah. And I'm sure that the, the technology has gotten better since yeah. then, so I'm still looking. Yeah. It'd be nice I to haven't put, it, put it in and you know, have it go quickly. Yeah, yeah, interesting. That's a good idea, because people have a lot of things laying around that they'd like oh, yeah. to consolidate. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this stuff I, I was telling Ashley earlier just really starts to deteriorate, mm -hmm. so yeah. probably, especially VHS tapes. So a lot of them are in really bad shape. So yeah. it's yeah. good to preserve that stuff. And they take up room mm -hmm. and collect dust. And, yeah. Well, yeah. and most people don't have a VCR anymore. So yeah. they don't know where to play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for exactly. Yeah. Any and other questions? Oh, go ahead, Marianne. Oh, I know, Paul, you keep in good touch with Laura's family. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. That's, that's nice, yep. yep. Yeah, it's, and that's one of the reasons why we moved back from the Twin Cities to this area. Uh -huh. uh, she has yep. five sisters in the area. So, mm -hmm. you know, not, not so much currently because I, you know, I, I, I can barely go and visit them without. Yeah, you know, exactly. But, but once, mm -hmm. once I get my final shot, maybe we'll mm -hmm. get yep. to yeah. yeah, you get a yeah. huge team together of all of her family, basically, every yeah. year for the run. It's such a blessing to mm -hmm. be able to, to have them, you know, because mm -hmm. we were kind of isolated up there in the Twin Cities. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's tough. Any other questions for Paul? I can't think of anything. 
Um, okay, well, if you're interested in purchasing the book, and I think Marianne and Joni already have it, but for anyone else watching, um, you can purchase it at our website, wisconsinovariancancer.org, and we will ship it to you, or we'll put a link in the chat as well. Um, and then um, we will also, once again, link those YouTube videos if you weren't able to watch them, and then you can hear them with the audio. So thank you all for joining us today. Thank, thank you. you. See you next time. <laughs>